Okay, hello everyone. Today I'm having a conversation with a guest on David Hume, specifically his treatise of human nature. And among the Australian Aboriginal community, my guest is considered an expert on Hume. I believe, uh, and I'm forgive me if I mispronounce it, but the name is Yaboy. Is that right? What's up? Okay, so as a, a Hume expert, what is Hume all about? What is his place in philosophical history and what draws you to his writings? All right, so I'm not an expert. I just read the book and that's my qualifications on this topic, just reading the treaties of human nature. But yeah, David Hume, you know, he's a pretty cool dude, I guess. He, he's from the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, so born in like 1711, died in 1776, obviously a significant date in history. And he um, was best known for essentially putting forward uh, one of the great texts regarding empiricism, skepticism, naturalism, secular thinking. He's held up there with the trinity of great British empiricists, which is like John Locke, George Berkeley, and then, of course, David Hume. And Hume is uh, more famous for limiting knowledge rather than expanding it and, and giving us like some actual feasible blueprint we can use to conduct science and uh, go and know things about the world. Rather, he actually gives us a bunch of problems through his understanding of the human mind and the anatomy of human reasoning that he tries to lay out. And so that's really Hume's biggest contribution is problems regarding causality and induction that we'll get into. And uh, learning Hume is essentially learning major problems in human reasoning. Yeah, right. So why don't we just start at the beginning? And um, the terminology for those who have read Locke can be a little uh, confusing or other empiricists like Schopenhauer as well, because everyone uses the term idea in a different sense. So the most critical distinction that Hume lays out in the very beginning is that between impressions and ideas. Locke uses the term idea in the broadest sense, basically to mean what Hume would term perceptions or just contents of the mind. Schopenhauer would use the term idea strictly in the platonic sense. For Hume, impressions are something like sensations, although they can also be kind of reflective sensations of our own emotional states and such. And then ideas are kind of reflection of these impressions. So with that kind of terminological confusion spelled out, um, what, what's the implication of this scheme that he draws? Yeah, so it's a good way to phrase Hume's project as being most concerned with the idea or the concept, uh, which, which is a project that most philosophers have. When you have an idea in the human mind, what does that actually mean? And so Hume takes a, a very extreme empirical position and says that essentially all the perceptions of the human mind resolve themselves into two distinct things. There are impressions and ideas. And ideas are just made up of impressions for the most part. So impressions enter the mind with this uh, vivacious force and violence. All the perceptions of sensations pass and emotions these are impressions and then ideas are the fainter image of these things in thinking and reasoning and so Hume's going to elevate the impression to essentially the highest form of awareness of, of anything and then an idea in human reasoning is the secondary effort to kind of reconstruct the and hold on to and make sense of the impressions that we have received and so that's really like the basic groundwork that Hume begins with this, this empiricist approach that all things in the human minds are impressions which are then imagined or fantasized to be ideas. Right. And uh, I will credit Hume that he always brings up the kind of counterexample or complexification of a scheme that he outlines. And so with impressions and ideas, ideas, the reflection of impressions, can themselves give rise to new sorts of impressions. So I have ideas generated from my contemplation of the impression of a scene, and then me reflecting on my own ideas after the fact brings upon, like brings up some new emotion or something like that. So there's a constant dialectic uh, back and forth, impressions begetting ideas, ideas begetting 
kind of reflective impressions. Um, and the next kind of distinction that he draws is that between simple and complex perceptions. So a, a simple impression is something that can't be reduced. And uh, the, the simple impression will have a corresponding simple idea universally. A complex impression um, will not necessarily correspond to a complex idea but why don't we spell out that uh, that kind of yeah. aspect? <clears throat> so that dialectic you were talking about, it's also worth saying that ideas resemble impressions and ideas are not as vivacious in the human mind and they will eventually, like without a direct impression, will linger away into nothingness and will no longer constitute a belief in the mind. But this second division a division in perception that he makes is between simple and complex. So that which is simple has no parts, while that which is complex has many parts. And so eventually Hume will say that because ideas are at their fundamental level simple and ideas that have parts are only constructed of simple ideas that themselves don't have parts, he's putting a limit on human reasoning where human reasoning isn't indivisible. Like it will reach a point where there's just these full, complete, irreducible blocks of ideas that can be stacked together to make more complex ideas. And so, right. and this complex, is, yeah, so this go is on. where the, um, the empiricist criteria of meaning that I mentioned before comes in. Because ideas are reflections of impressions, he says, we always have to trace back any philosophical concept, which would be a complex idea, to its original impressions. Um, so yeah, is... so the simple ideas are just like a, a reflection of the impression, and then complex ideas are not these exact copies, but if you break them into their simple parts, then obviously they will be just the remembered impression in the mind. Mm -hmm. And regarding these simple or rather complex ideas, he draws a distinction between the kind of analytic judgments that we can make regarding the relation of our ideas to each other, and then the synthetic kind of judgments we can make regarding the correspondence between complex ideas and actual things in the world. So he tries to restrict the kinds of claims we can make on the one hand by forcing us to trace those complex ideas back to their simple impressions, and on the other hand, ultimately opening up to a kind of fundamental skepticism regarding the the actuality of any referent of any complex idea, i.e. any synthetic judgment or any truth about the world, because the way that these complex ideas are formed together are ultimately based on types of psychological habit. And so he'll define how these complex ideas come about in terms of the laws of association. But then a, a typical of Hume, he kind of backs off these as laws and says rather these are just kind of predominating forces leading to the construction of complex ideas uh, the the kind of passage from one idea onto another but it's also possible for them to be more or less random or at the volition perhaps so he leaves that kind of up for interpretation uh, but what do you make of these the principles of association and how that relates to the way that we form complex ideas. Yeah, so Hume will make as his argument essentially that because there is this constant conjunction between ideas and impressions, he believes that they appear at the same time, that this proves the independence of one of, of the other because Hume will go on to just define causality as constant conjunction and therefore impressions cause ideas. This kind of schema is what Hume tries to say is like the first principle of the science of human nature, which is, again, this goal of his book. But then later as the book develops, I feel like Hume has a, a more humility and he often will like apologize for the way he has written things and how it might be not only difficult to understand, but even in second edition of the book he will just tell the reader to ignore parts like his uh discussion on personal identity but in the beginning of the book he's very strict about laying out the science of human nature and the conjunction of ideas and impressions through that association is key but i think there's something also worth saying is that so he does give a strict division between impressions so an impression can be a sensation and a reflection 
And so the first type, the sensation, this is something that he writes as arising in the soul from like a from an unknown cause. And the second, the reflection is derived from our ideas. So he will he would term reflection as something like fear, for instance, like an idea enters your mind that is scary and you feel fear and that's a new impression, like an emotional response to an idea that's received in the mind. And so when an impression is made on the mind, it emerges as an idea. There's these associated principles put forward, which are like guiding forces that cause the mind to choose to associate one idea with another. And this becomes this list of these guiding principles become a very big point of contention for Hume and explaining how these principles themselves can actually make sense of human knowledge. And the answer is that they can't, at least fully. And the skepticism comes in. And right. essentially, so basically, he is taking a psychological kind of interpretation of the generation of our thought, and he is stealing directly from the kind of, uh, I guess, pre psychological literature that was happening in Britain at the time. Associationist psychology uh, did have its origins in the 18th century and then continued on with people like Bentham and Mill, and, and really. The associationist psychology can be seen in behaviorism, and um, it's not altogether far off um, from the standpoint of contemporary psychology. And so uh, I, one thing that I noticed was that his principles of association, his distinction between impressions and ideas, and also their similarity between impressions and ideas do really reflect the kind of biological nature of thought, the way that the nervous system works. Uh, I did a synopsis of Jeff Hawkins' book on intelligence, and I noted there that of all the philosophical epistemological systems that I'm familiar with, um, Hume's comes closest to that described by Jeff Hawkins as kind of the operation of the neurocortex. Uh, but the specifically, the principles of association are resemblance, contiguity, and cause and effect. So if two yeah. ideas, go ahead. That is the, uh, that, that's the three basic ones he puts forward. But he says upon complex ideas, there are then seven sources of relation, which are resemblance, identity, space and time, which he puts together. Quantity, which is like number, quality, which is like the degree. The quantity and quality is like extensive, intensive. Uh, contrariety and cause and effect. And cause and effect he will privilege as the only association or associated principle or relation of the seven that can actually produce a new idea of something that wasn't in the impressions of uh, given to the person having the idea. So causality is the only one that can produce new knowledge that wasn't already in the ideas being looked at. So it's ext of extreme importance to Hume to analyze cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Right. So these, uh, what he describes as the seven, uh, I guess, categories of relation between complex ideas uh, that is distinct from the other kinds of complex ideas he discusses, uh, one being mode and the other being substance. And uh, just like he ends up being skeptical of the nature of these relations between complex ideas, like I noticed that there are, are three balls here, there are three cows there. My ma mind passes from the three balls to the three cows by virtue of their shared participation in the quantity of three or in the quality of being red or, you know, even uh, the negation of an object can cause us to kind of pass into its opposite. Um, so mm. these, these he questions as mere kind of psychological habits. In the same sense, he questions substance and, and ultimately will end up questioning the validity of personal identity on this basis. Yeah, and generally um, the, the discussion comes up again in the chapter before on the ancient philosophy regarding substance and traditional ideas and say ancient Greek philosophy. And it's quite what his criticisms of these ideas and in ancient philosophy, it's a particular type of criticism where he doesn't actually show how the system put forward by some previous thinker is contradictory for, uh, or, or any actual direct criticism of those ideas. It's essentially just pointing out that they don't share the same conclusion on the human understanding that I do, and they're so, so therefore they are wrong, which is a, it's kind of like a soft criticism 
I would say. Like, he won't actually address the argument for the logical necessity of something like substance put forward by someone like Plato. Uh, it's it's mostly just this can't exist given my epistemic framework and therefore it's childish to believe in such a thing. Obviously with substance, he will say, okay, so substance must be derived from an impression of sensation. It must be a color, a sound, a taste, etc. Yet substance by definition is not any of these sensations. Uh, uh, if it's an impression of a reflection, so it's not a sensation, it has to be in our passions and emotions, which it also can't possibly be if it, if it is actually a substance. And so substance therefore can't exist. But what he will call, like what we would say substance is, is just a, uh, a collection of simple ideas that are united by the imagination when we see them in like heterogeneous objects. So, for instance, when we see, uh, like, a, the classic example of a whole bunch of different breeds of dog, obviously each one is very different from the other, but they also have something analogous between them, and that analogy between them is just a fiction of the imagination. We see the same simple ideas in each one, all these defining characteristics of a dog, and we unite them in the mind, and that's all substance is. It isn't, like, an abstract idea that really uh, exists outside of the human fancy. Right. And so in a, in a similar way, he will doubt the existence. He, he uses the term soul, but he will really doubt the existence of the soul and say that ultimately we are this kind of succession of impressions and ideas kind of passing before us on this stage, but we're not the stage itself. In a way, the stage itself, the Cartesian theater of consciousness uh, with the homunculus sitting there viewing the the action on the stage, that doesn't exist. The only thing that really exists is the succession of ideas. Um, and it's ultimately, as you kind of point out, a bit facile because he lays out this kind of empiricist criterion of meaning, which says that any valid concept, complex idea, must be derived from simple impressions. So it necessarily follows then that anything that is not a simple impression cannot have this kind of, uh, you know, ultimate reference to something in a meaningful sense. It can only be some kind of habit or, you know, kind of loose reference to the soul. It's something that can't be strictly defined. And I, it's important to note that he really doesn't take a lot of time trying to justify this empiricist criteria of meaning like how no, does not at all. it's so, also worth saying on the question of identity it, it does follow the exact same reasoning which is that there isn't like a single impression we can attribute to the self and also the, for but the clencher for hume and it's quite a specific and extreme assumption and it's one about change and identity because obviously we can say well there's a collection of impressions we can see as the self. You could even say like your physical body, for instance, but then Hume will make the objection. And this is a fair objection in that instance, but I think it's, he has a very extreme take on it, which is that if something is changing, then it can't can have a continuance of identity and even a very slow, gradual change, like a tree that you've seen for 10 years and it's always looked pretty much the same. Uh, that even in the case of such a gradual change like that, uh, we are actually have a change in the identity of the object and our tendency to regard that thing that is changing as the same over time is a mistake. And he calls it a confusion of two types of identity, qualitative, and uh, which he calls specific and numerical identity. And so he will say that something like the soul is just this fiction of an unchanging thing that's created. So he's even less generous with what a soul is to a substance, because a substance is like some is a fiction that in the, his first addressing of it is actually useful. Like it's useful to see what's analogous between dogs. But in this case, he says it's just a fiction of, of some unchanging thing in a succession of what he would say are numerically distinct objects that is like the mental states of the mind when, and that is the real self and this any self that is constant and unchanging is just a product of the imagination the, the lock obviously defines the self as a mental state as primarily memory and so hume would object to that like it is very similar but hume would say these mental states are related by cause and effect and imagination to a distinct like sorry the memory in Locke's case are, are numerically distinct memories but they have to be related by cause and effect and so that 
is the real principle of the self, which is really not a self. It's a series of selves in many ways. And so, yeah, he, this discussion of like throwing out, you know, the annals of like philosophy before him because they don't fit into this framework of impressions, but turning into ideas, turning into impressions of reflection is very, you know, it's a, a common theme throughout the whole text. Right. And uh, he does, I think, break down certain assumptions and dogmas of the philosophical categories going before him. But he also introduces this kind of new dogma of the empiricist criteria of meaning and also the distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments being uh, analytic judgments we can say are absolutely true. We can know the relation between our ideas, but we can't know ultimately things about the external world. We only know how our mind associates these basic, you know, almost instinctual just impressions, intensities that hit us and how that reflects into this kind of after image and the, the capabilities of the mind in uh, reconstellating these kind of after effect impressions and ideas. We can know all of that, but we can't know uh, like kind of higher level um, truths about reality propositions, properly speaking. Um, and the, both of these notions that uh, ideas are necessarily derived from simple impressions or any concept, a valid concept, will have to be derived from simple impressions, and that there is some kind of fundamental distinction between claims about the operation of our mind and claims about the external world. Uh, both of these are new kind of assumptions that he brings into philosophy, and they are taken up. And in Kant, uh, the distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments and this kind of empiricist criteria of meaning are relevant, but Kant at least kind of introduces this category of of transcendental analysis so it's assumed with with descartes the kind of unity of the self Locke basically assumes it as well in a modified form hume tries to throw it out and then this forces kant into a position where he has to make an argument for this kind of transcendental unity yeah i would argue though with hume's case on personal identity that it's not it's not canon in his greater thought out philosophy and is not necessary to believe either, particularly regarding his view on change and identity. Like, I don't think that's related to the rest of his system in Hume. And I think, and, and in the second edition, like I said, he comes forward and says that his position on it was just a labyrinth and was verbose and uh, essentially it's not really something that he had thought out well enough. And so I would defend Hume by saying that it's it's just a brief discussion on the topic at the end of the, the first book of the treatise. And it's not like Kant who has a very, very extensive discussion on it throughout the critique of pure reason. Um, so with Hume, it, it does re remain more or less informal. Um, and all of his writing has a certain kind of informal quality. Uh, just biographically, he was a scholar by his own choice, but he didn't finish university. Um, he didn't acquire literary fame early. But he was he wrote the treatise in his 20s still. Uh, but he did, he was kind of a bon vivant, you know, he liked, enjoyed sensu sensuous pleasures, and that might contribute also to certain of his doctrines where he will say things like the kind of knowledge, like practical daily knowledge that we rely on is not philosophical, and really we have no say in it. It's it, pure instinct and habit. I think the way he puts it is that nature wouldn't trust us and trust to us the most kind of critical aspects of daily life. And so this, he's anticipating romanticism. He did have a relationship with Rousseau. They also had a falling out. Um, but when I first read this or started to read the treatise of human nature a few years ago, I thought, well, this seems very dry and kind of analytical and, and boring. But when you get into Hume, he's really not that way at all. And there's something respectable, I think, about the kind of informal nature of his discourse and how he does constantly move back and forth and, you know, doubt his own assumptions. So he's it's not like he's laying down these impressions and ideas and empirical criteria of meaning 
explicitly as principles on which to found a system, but the fact that he does so in an informal way leads to certain conclusions that end up being circular. And I think we should move into a discussion of causality because that is his most important contribution. Yeah, I, think. I, I think I think there's a lot in the text that we should, that, like, for instance, with the argument regarding abstract ideas, I think that's something that comes before the discussion on causality, which really unfolds in the second part of this book. So regarding abstract ideas, put very simply, so with if you watched Arvel's videos on the forms, it's this idea that because the world is changing, there's this necessity for something that is unchanging that's analogous between things that are, despite being heterogeneous in experience, like sensory impressions of it, are still analogous at some more abstract level. Hume will use the example of, say, a straight line. If you conjure a straight line in your mind right now, you imagine a line of a certain length, of a certain width, and more or less it has a quantity and a quality and so therefore it cannot be a general representation of all straight lines because straight lines can be very very different and so he will argue that because in the mind it is inconceivable to have a general straight line that is of all qu possible quantities and qualities there is no such thing as a general abstract straight line the idea of a straight line is a specific uh particular idea and all abstract ideas for instance like the perfect triangle whether it be an isosceles or a right angle it cannot represent all triangles and this so therefore an abstract idea is inconceivable in the mind his, kind of, his nominalism here follows from the idea that ideas are necessarily reflections of impressions if you accept that in the first place then where yeah. would we get the idea of this kind of universality of the line the way he just i like the way he describes how our mind passes from one specific example of a straight line into a class of related things that we kind of group into this same name. So we have the name of the straight line that calls to mind a particular idea, which is ultimately derived from some element of some impression. And we kind of conjure up a set of indistinguish or not completely indistinguishable but similar enough lines that share some resemblance such that our mind uh, out of habit, out of the constant conjunction of these alternatives that the mind naturally associates with the first straight line, we get this idea of a collection of things, a set of things to which this one name can apply. And so basically he says we get the idea of, of abstract ideas from this principle of association based on resemblance. And my kind of criticism here would be if there is such a thing as resemblance aren't you like isn't there something that causes the mind to be able to associate between certain resembling things and not others and this issue of resemblance right. is completely unaddressed like well it's true with all of this all of the all of the uh relations in the mind like resemblance identity space and time quantity number and contrariety like when you lay out this is a very very common criticism of nominalism period is like you lay out these seven things that aren't in an impression but are a way of seeing how impressions relate to each other and then the first question is well how does this fit into your system where everything in the mind has to be an impression at one point if you've already admitted that these seven things are not impressions where are they where are they in sensory experience where are these in the senses you know the realist would then argue that they're a priori concepts but you don't have to be a platonic realist to to say that uh like kant obviously is going to then take these things and co make them far more complex and then insert them into the human mind as a means of representing the object to the subject and so yeah that's a that's probably like the most common criticism criticism of nominalism is that eventually you're going to have to put forward something even as simple as resemblance that something is like something else and that quality of likeness is not going to be apparent in sensory experience there is no simple impression that is likeness itself and so where do, what is likeness then and the realists will posit that it's an abstract concept and so you know that's something that hume never really addresses right either. that response would be conceptualism i think classical platonism would be this kind of platonic realism that's or, what i that's why i said you don't have to be a platonic realist just a realist in the sense that there are abstract concepts and they aren't just fictions 
Right. And then I think where Hume would probably be inclined to respond would be in the vein of pragmatism, where, I mean, we have this kind of vague notion of resemblance and we have it as uh, a habit, an instinct, but it's not something that we actually know. We don't know the nature of resemblance, but we'll act as if in this kind of pragmatic turn, uh, you know, this is a principle of association because it seems to be. And, and he does, again, rely back on this kind of uh, non-explicit, intuitive, philosophical method that I think people can easily find sympathy with. And I think that's why the pragmatic response to realism and the problem of universals has has been effective, even though ultimately, no, it, it doesn't solve the the issue of, of why these why we're able to associate these ideas, what exactly we're talking about with resemblance. Yeah, I think his um he would address the as well, and this is something that he repeats with most of these relations, is that it's this weighing up or seeing how objects in experience sit with each other like the idea of extension it's just this difference between one object in one place and its position elsewhere and through this inference we get the idea of extension and it's not like an abstract concept it's just this seeing how objects relate to each other so yeah we could uh, get to causation for sure okay uh well yeah, this idea that constant conjunction uh, between things that result in each other, like water, whenever we see water get on something, we see that thing get wet. It, it seems like the water is the cause of this change in whatever it touches. And what we know by impression and by reflection on our ideas, the relation of our ideas uh, derived from impression is that the the two events constantly succeed one another. And it's Im impossible for us to have an idea of the actual causal potency or force uh, underlying this, this power that the object seems to have. We have a vague notion of this force. And he talks about even how we're conscious of causal potencies in our ideas. And we conceive of someone's role in society based on the kind of causal relations they might have with someone else. This is like running over our ideas of the judge in his ability to, you know, come up with a verdict on a case, uh, even if it's not happening. We kind of speculate and pass with this association of ideas uh, about this kind of causal potency using this principle of association derived ultimately from constant conjunction. But essentially cause and effect presupposes two of the other relations put forward, and that is succession, which is time, and uh, contiguity, meaning that it, a cause obviously has to touch the effect in some way. They have to be connected in, in this sense. But beyond that, beyond those two things, contiguity and succession, nothing else can be added to get to causality. And so often one might say, that production is the nature of causality because causality produces a change or an object or an action but Hume would just respond to that by saying well what do we define production as and there's no other answer than causality which is all, all contiguity and succession and ca causality is still unexplained and contiguity and succession together are obviously not causality because we see things that connect with each other in, contigu in a contiguous way and are in succession in time but don't cause each other. Like if I clapped my hands and my light bulb went out by coincidence, we wouldn't say that I caused my light bulb to go out. So it's not satisfactory to explain causality. And so we are left looking for this necessary connection because obviously when we see causality, we, we really feel that it is more than just that conjunction and following of a cause and effect in time. There has to be this, yeah, like this productive force and production is, is still lost for some type of definition that can arrive us at a satisfactory understanding of causality. And this obviously undermines many principles in philosophy that were taken for granted, such as that all things that exist must have a cause. That notion is particularly pointed out by Hume, this cosmological principle that goes back to in Aristotle. 
And so if we can never demonstrate the necessity of a cause to each new existence, that those types of principles really get thrown out the window. Yeah, it can't be demonstrated because, again, our ideas have to be generated from impressions, and there's no impression of the causal force. There's only, as you put it, these other kind of conjunction, uh, contiguity, and succession relations. But there is a definite contradiction because he says basically that since our ideas have to be produced by our impressions, caused by our impressions, this imposes a limit on the idea that we can have of causality. And so we have to basically throw out causality as like a rigorous philosophical concept. We don't know it with analytical certainty. It's just this kind of problem knowledge, a habit, something that works for us. But in the first place, you laid it out as a, a philosophical principle, as something hard and fast that an idea is produced by an impression. So if we don't know that ideas are caused by impressions, because we don't know anything about causality fundamentally, then we can't know that we can't know that uh, causal necessary relations actually do adhere between different events. And so we, we might say that according to the definition given by Hume of an idea, we can't have an idea of causality, but perhaps mm -hmm. there's another faculty in the mind that actually does directly grasp this necessary connection. And that would be the direction that Schopenhauer moves to respond to Hume. And uh, he, I think Schopenhauer argues very well from the kind of given fact of perception that we are able to infer the depth of different objects in our field of view because if we simply received a mat of sense impressions, these kind of Humean impressions, and then generated our ideas based on this kind of after effect of that, this would never get us the idea of depth and, and an external object that is the cause of these ideas in our mind, of these perceptions. And so, like I said, Hume assumes that impressions cause ideas, and Schopenhauer takes that seriously and says, we already assume that our impressions themselves have causes in order to generate the kind of, of ideal representation that we do. And uh, of course, for Schopenhauer, perception is something that happens after ideas. For Hume, there's perceptions, and then there's two species of perceptions, impressions and ideas. Perceptions are the most general. For Schopenhauer, it's rather that you have uh, sense data, which comes in as impressions, this is filtered through an a priori faculty of the understanding, which is our sense of causality. And that is just inextricable from our mental nature. It's part of us fundamentally. And that converts these impressions into actual perceptions. And that conversion, which allows us to perceive depth, which allows us to make sense of the world as world and not just as a map of sense data, that requires already kind of transcendentally that we presume causality so it's maybe not yeah. an idea or a concept but it is an intuition and it is known like Hume will continue to use the word causality into his analysis of it but he will use it thinking that constant conjunction is a satisfactory definition of causality so Hume sp specifies that when he says an idea is caused by an impression, he simply means that they always appear together. And that's satisfactory for Hume. It doesn't actually have to be produced by it for Hume to be happy with this system of ideas. And in the case of Schopenhauer, I think, yeah, so Schopenhauer is essentially saying that when the eye looks at a rose and it sees the color red and its shape, it is presupposing that something has affected the senses in order to leave an impression on it, of which then the the mind goes and interprets that thing affecting it and distinguishes the cause, which is the light coming off the rose or, or, or whatever. And so I think that's a good argument uh, that causality can be known a priori. And then somebody might say that, well, because it is known in the mind and isn't in sensory experience and therefore we cannot know it but to say that you have to essentially be saying that everything known a priori is uh not real or not outside the human mind which is a contentious position to take and if you believe in a priori truths like mathematics for instance then you would have to accept that 
as a good argument unless you can think of something else. Yeah, I think with, for instance, Descartes, this is another example of where Hume will continue his use of the word causality, given its new meaning of just constant conjunction, with the classic mind-brain gap and materialism. And he will defend Hobbes's materialism particularly. And the idea that because matter cannot think and have mental states, therefore the human mind cannot be material. And Hume would just respond by saying that, well, we don't need to see a physical thing produce a mental thing. Uh, all we need to see is a mental thing and a physical thing at this, in constant conjunction, which is something that everybody has to agree with. And then that is enough to say that a physical thing can cause a mental thing and then be a materialist. But obviously a materialist is not necessarily happy with that explanation of causality and that explanation of human consciousness as just being in conjunction with the physical world. It has to be physical itself. Right. So regarding this idea that constant conjunction uh, can be equated to causality, um, it, it seems clear to me that something more is necessarily involved. Do you think Hume gives an account of what this something more is? Because clearly the naive person on the street thinks they have an idea of causality. They feel that they have some kind of notion. How does Hume account for this naive notion since, con you know, conjunction of two things that succeed one another or are contiguous is not exactly the same as what people generally mean. So how does Hume account for the, the origin of this naive sense of causality? I think that what Hume will say is that when a if a philosopher will try to create some explanation for a problem in human reasoning, that is obviously going to be a long chain of arguments that is esoteric and that the common person isn't going to be interested in. Uh, that they're kind of wasting their time because we know that the average person isn't going to be able to grasp such an argument and to, to then live their life by it. But rather, they're going to just be laboring under this habit or custom of cause and effect, of seeing two things at the same time and then declaring that there's some productive power in it because of the amount of times they've seen it. And that is genuinely not rational. And that the average person who has this irrational assumption of causality is just living their life by it out of sheer habit and custom. And so Hume isn't going to give a rational defense of the average person and he's going to say that of any philosopher that tries to create this really verbose or you know entangled or systematic explanation of causality is just not going to be realistically mapping out the human understanding because the average person isn't going to have any idea what they're talking about yet they're still going to be using causality to make sense of the world right and it'll be necessarily in a vague kind of way a vague sense and i guess what i am pointing to there is there are transcendental argument uh, yeah there are transcendental arguments we can make which would establish that something is leading to this perception the naive perception of causality so like there has to be some kind of sufficient reason underlying it although there again is another kind of metaphysical principle that hume would reject um, as as a priori certain that everything must have some kind of sufficient reason underlying it. When Schopenhauer addresses this notion that there's a reason for being for everything, there's a reason why it is what it is, um, he, he does take it as this kind of fundamental assumption of thought, which if you reject it, it leads to absurdity. Um, and I think Hume just is comfortable with rejecting it and embracing the absurdity to the, to the extent where he doesn't, he can't set up any philosophical system, even his skepticism will remain unsystematic. But in a certain sense, it is still salutary to, to have happened to break down certain kind of rigid assumptions, uh, even within Locke um, and, you know, his, his predecessors. But... Um, what about my I have a criticism of Hume that I think is 
for me, kind of one of the absurdities that he has to end up admitting by sticking to this system. And that is to do with the idea of belief. And so when it comes to when we say we believe something, uh, what most people would take that to mean is that when they believe X, they believe X exists or is true. And with Hume, the idea of existence and non-existence cannot actually be real information or a real idea in the mind because of their abstract nature. And so he will have to say that we, or when we fathom something, to say that it exists is not an additional idea attached to it. It is a given. It is to say to say something is to say something exists, and there's no distinguishing between those two ideas. Existence is not a predicate of a subject. Uh, yeah, so that is a, a way it is often put, but it is not. But he would. I think he goes further than that by saying that it is not an idea at all, because clearly to say that something exists is a separate proposition to just saying something. Um, you are right, like, with, for instance, with Schopenhauer's criticism of Anselm's ontological argument, which, which goes back to Aristotle's statement on, on the matter that existence is not a predicate, but it is still a proposition. It's still an idea, it's still a concept. But, but Hume has to reject this. And so what he ends up saying belief is, is just the vivaciousness of an idea, which is to say, because obviously an impression is the most vivacious uh, mental state. And so what, what belief is, is just something's approaching of an impression. The more it resembles an impression, the more we believe it. And I actually think that is the most absurd part that for me personally, when I read book one of Hume, is having to come to the question of existence and belief. And so clearly, I think when we believe something, and maybe this is more of an open question than like a criticism, if somebody believes in God, but yet they've never seen God, it's never been an impression in the mind, and so it is not vivacious at all, would that person's belief that God exists uh, just be like something that isn't a belief, but they've just mistaken it to be one? Like clearly... People can believe something exists without that thing having to just be this vivacious impression in the mind. Right. But he would, again, point to these kind of principles of association in saying if someone is constantly presented with the idea of God and maybe in their mind, you know, the specific idea of like the old man with the beard in the clouds or something like that pops up i mean it's it's not we're not referring to this kind of abstract existence of god in our mind according to hume we're referring to specific kind of perceptible mental phenomena that refer like with ambiguity to a class of related things that we can reach via association this repetition of this process ingrains in us the habit of associating, you know, the name God with historical events. And he'll talk about how if you've been to the Holy Land, you're far more likely to believe the Bible stories because you can associate these narratives with concrete memories that you have of landscapes. And that's also pertinent to the idea of belief, this kind of connection between memory. So for, for Hume, you go from impressions into ideas by insensible degrees and at a certain point, the immediate reflection of an impression is simply memory, where each specific idea and complex is indistinguishable from its original uh, kind of temporal and spatial relations. And so it's, it's kind of when we remember something, when I remember the lifeguard that I saw at the pool, I remember him or her more likely her in a specific context in a specific timeline and that's connected you know i would put it or schopenhauer would put it within a causal nexus that we represent to ourselves uh hume's gonna drop that kind of a priori causal nexus that we're fitting it into but the memory is solid in that it's it's in its original kind of permanent relations with the nearby impressions and then you move into ideas that become more detached we can refer or pass with more ambiguity between an old idea or an idea that is you know taken away from its immediate impressionistic context 
Um, but so this is related to the idea of belief because memory has a certain kind of force and constancy and so does belief. And so I think how I would make sense of this belief being the force and vivacity of an, of an idea um, would be to say that what, what we're really doing, what Hume doesn't realize he's getting at, but he is, I think, is that when our propositions generated from ideas uh, lead to things that we remember, they are leading to things that are connected to a kind of causal nexus that we automatically construct regarding the world. And that is our network of belief, our, our supposition of this fixed uh, relation of states in space and time through the medium of, of causal potency. So I think that's how you can make sense of why he comes up. Like if we're going to psychologize Hume and kind of generate a theory of how he came up with the idea of belief, I think that might be more or less what he's getting at. Um, or what do you think of that? Well, with the question of memory, he would say that the memory is inferior to the direct experience of an impression and that it would it will fade into obscurity. Also, that long chains of arguments, even like the one that you just gave, are less persuasive than uh, shorter arguments, which are less persuasive than just direct experience because right. the imagination and the memory are not as lively as the direct impression. He gives those that type of example, like a Catholic, for instance, who goes to church and has all of these sacraments and uh, the rosary and all of these constructs that are meant to be points of relation to God through one of those types of seven principles or a, um, a relic of like a saint or something. It's this point of relation to uh, a holy figure. But none of these none of these things are impressions. They're all just relations. None of them are an impression of God. And the only type of relation that could allow you to know God to exist from an impression that is not God is causality. And the fact that, you know, you pray the rosary, I mean, none of that is causally related to God. It's just resemblance. And um, it's definitely not able by Hume's standard to produce a new idea in the mind that isn't related to something that is having some type of sensory or reflective experience of. But even there, I can have a certain respect for Hume's account because I think the average person, church-going person, their conception of God isn't a true concept. And it, it doesn't refer to something beyond experience. God, for them, is love or something tangible. It, he's, he's everywhere. He's the ordering principle. He's kind of the, the, the idea that certain things associate it according to a providence. It's like good things happening for me. Or, you know, bad things happening to bad people, that the idea of justice, like all of these kind of very loosely constellated uh, mundane experiences, which are associated with our value structure. I think that is what comes to mind when someone is thinking of God. And, you know, we don't have a clear and distinct idea of God. Um, but nevertheless, like that doesn't stop us from believing in him which is this kind of, again, informal nature to Hume's uh, philosophical method and his concession to the way that everyday people actually think. It, people don't walk around with a philosophical argument for God, usually, or like a clear, separate, abstract idea of what he is, of his nature, as distinct from these kind of associated ideas derived from everyday experience. I mean, maybe, yeah, I... From everybody I know that goes to church, they usually talk about God in extremely personal terms. He is a person that they have a type of relationship with. Uh, and also, that's because you, you go to a Catholic church. I've never had experience going to a Catholic church, so it could be different in that regard as well. Right. But he's the person that has is a character from a, a book that they've have read often. I and mean, that's kind of one way of putting it, as it's derived from the impressions they have of uh, of you know, reading this book, the, the images, the ideas that are uh, generated from reading the Bible, constantly associated, create a complex idea, which has its origin, as you would say, in the simple impressions ultimately derived from the act of listening to the Bible or reading the Bible. But uh, so that's one way to kind of reconcile uh, a personalist conception of God versus an impressionistic origin of ideas. But even there, like Hume doesn't really account for 
how we're able to make meaning out of text. And he doesn't account for exactly what language is. And, and so like he, I don't think he can account for how someone can make sense out of his own book um, and, right. and possibility of linguistic reference. But I think he recognizes that there's, there's no clear way to Im- interpret his own text because he's constantly going back and qualifying things. And he even breaks down at a cer- certain section towards the end of, of book one where he says he's like, he feels like he's stranded on an island with like, with no one there and he's completely alone and the kind of waters are, you know, closing in on him. And he, he just wants to go and socialize and put down philosophy forever. And so it, I think it's clear that he's, he's conscious of a kind of very deep inner contradiction in what he's trying to explicate as the limits of our knowledge. And then the fact that, well, according to that, my explication of these limits are themselves limited um, and this has to do with this this problem that he he can't account for um, ultimately the resemblance and laws of association that make language possible that make it possible to have meaningful descriptions of things that have not been seen um, directly uh, and so yeah that's that's a deep tension probably the deepest tension in it like is he sufficiently skeptical of his own skepticism often he is but it's something that's never fully re- addressed within hume himself i think there's also something else that we didn't talk about regarding um causality which be- comes to a greater assumption in human reasoning that is also irrational to hume which is essentially the idea that everything that we haven't experienced will be like that which we have experienced and the obvious example is that there's no reason to believe that a constant conjunction of two things remembered in our experience will hold true for everything we haven't experienced the causality itself and so that relates to this greater principle that we suppose but are never able to prove that there is a resemblance of objects that we haven't experienced and those which we have right and hence, uh, there is meant to be this union of ideas that it's not made in reason, but by certain principles in the imagination, we unite them, but they're not rational. The problem of induction, which is the assumption underneath all inductive reasoning that things in the past will be like they were, are in the future, simply because in the past they were like in the future, which is obviously a circular argument. Yeah, and if we get our knowledge about causality from experience if it's a posteriori that we we kind of extrapolate these causal principles that might allow us to predict things into the future then clearly we we won't have a ground for any any sort of prediction of the future that and you know induction reasoning based on previous experience will ultimately be impossible in a formal sense and all we'll have to rely on is the kind of probabilistic reasoning. Um, probabli- probabilistic reasoning for Hume will not be, you know, statistical. Obviously, those methods weren't really developed at that time. But it's it's more so like the the again the psychological principles dictating that when we experience something together often we're more likely to to expect it in the future and these are kind of weighted by the number of their inc- uh, incidents but this whole thing presupposes that we know about causality from experience that we're getting these ideas from our impressions if on the other hand we take like a a scientific realist kind of epistemology where we're positing the existence, our model of an external world that does obey these laws, then then we can easily predict things into the future. So basically Hume doesn't have an epistemological justification for induction. And so he's left to these kind of psychological principles why we inductively argue for things and make decisions on that basis. So yeah, according to Hume's own standards, induction is problematic, but I don't know if it necessarily has to be. Yeah, interesting. I think that there's a lot that we've said already. There's uh, like going about there's uh and then there's this discussion about human reason and its three kinds of like knowledge, proofs, and probability, and these types of distinctions are 
particularly find that interesting. They don't really lead to much, but it's just the way Hume, I guess, categorizes the mind. But there's no necessity to make that type of distinction, really. Um, I find the chapter on the ancient philosophy quite interesting. We've already talked about Aristotle and how he kind of ridicules him for conjuring up ideas of substances, accidents, and occult qualities. He'll make the argument that because the substance and the accident are indistinguishable in Hume's system in the mind on the basis of impressions and anything that is distinct must be separable in the mind and because it isn't, they must be the same thing. And so substances and accidents must be the same. He'll make that type of argument. And then he goes on to the modern philosophy, which he's far more charitable with. And by modern philosophy, he almost entirely means just John Locke. He has a discussion on teleological causes where he attributes any cause like falling of a stone being some type of motive attributed to the stone as just childish, just like how children will play with stones in their backyard and get assigned the motives. And again, just going back to what I said before, is not really like a showing of how Aristotle's reasoning falls apart, but more of just how it can't exist if you assume the conclusions that Hume has come to in the prior sections. But yeah, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think we've basically hit on most of the major points. You you mentioned kind of in passing this idea that if two things are distinguishable, then they're separable and, and vice versa. Um, that, I think there's a lot that can be made of this. Um, and I, I think it's ultimately derived from Leibniz, the indiscernibility of identity right. so we we define identity basically as an inability to distinguish difference within the thing that we're considering and so this is the kind of identity that i think hume would accept this kind of analytic identity where it's it's defined ultimately by a capacity for recognition of difference um, and that's a kind of pragmatic functionalist turn on what what an identity ultimately means it is very much in keeping with all of his principles of association and, and it's not necessarily something to set aside entirely the idea that like identity is what we're able to uh discern within a thing that actually fits in in a way with my own thinking but what do you yeah, think yeah I, I mean there's right? a there's a statement to be made about like confusing epistemic distinction from ontological distinction a classic example in the Leibniz principle will be that for a very long time, the morning star and the evening star were thought to be two different stars because of their appearance in the, and time in the night sky. But obviously both are just Venus. And so because they had discernible properties and were separable in the mind, if one concluded that they were ontologically the same, they would be wrong in doing so. And so there's that type of argument one could make to Hume uh, when he comes to it, addressing those types of right. questions. But, yeah. That that specific problem I don't think would be a problem for Hume because Hume would reject the identity through time of Venus in the first place. Yeah, he would. He would. Uh, yeah, I was more talking about his statement on substance and accidents, really. But yeah, yeah. Um, There's also a discussion on uh, Spinoza where he kind of defends Spinoza in an interesting way uh, because he talks about the theologian believing that the soul is a perfectly simple substance, like it's this first mover in the body, and that thoughts are also just a mode of this perfectly simple substance. They're just a modification of it, but nonetheless are only unique in appearance or distinct in appearance and are really just from the wellspring of the soul, which is without parts. And uh, Spinoza obviously believed that the same thing were true of the universe, which is something that a lot of people in history have believed. And so Hume kind of has a little humorous section where he says that any criticism of the latter, of Spinoza's view, any criticism of like, well, how can a perfectly simple thing have heterogeneous and contradictory properties? Like, how can it manifest itself as a circular table and a square table? Uh, th these types of problems also apply to the soul. And so he actually says that the immortality of the soul devolves into atheism in like a joking mm. kind of way. And so that's kind of a funny little part of the 
last section of the first book of the trees. Yeah, it makes you wonder what his actual thoughts on Spinoza were, and and also his thoughts on uh, monotheism or deism. Period. He inserts a couple like passing arguments for the existence of God and how it's just plain from the order of nature that there is God and, and this is sufficient. And I don't know if that's to appease authorities or if if and the extent of, of Hume's faith has been questioned by a lot of scholars. But overall, I think it is still an enjoyable uh, read. It's something that we should be familiar with if we're going to move on into Kantian studies and then uh, German idealism more broadly. And Hume is also directly relevant to logical positivism, the behaviorists, I mean, basically 20th century philosophy up until the 50s. Um, so he had lasting uh, effects throughout the, the history of modern Western philosophy. He had he's a bit you know he has a bit of humor in him. He's he he's fun to read. He has an attitude, uh, but it can also be a bit tedious because he he does go on on some things that could be put a bit simpler. Simpler. Do you have any concluding thoughts on the book on Hume? Yeah, not really. I personally find Hume's system kind of silly. I don't really take it that seriously i think it is interesting and hume is intelligent obviously that's just my opinion on like not in terms of not agreeing with what he has to say i think that hume is a good example of how one who is a materialist or a nominalist has to end up thinking in many ways and becoming so skeptical and uh so unallowing of various ways of thinking, particularly mathematics. Hume is very mean towards mathematicians, I guess. He's, he thinks that it's a very decadent discipline in many ways. And I, I think that is something that you have to believe if you don't believe in things like abstract ideas. And so I like Hume in the sense that he's kind of refreshing because there are a lot of people who would start with those intuitive beliefs that Hume does, but then want to have their cake and eat it too. And it's, I don't know, I think there's something nice about reading someone that's logically consistent in that in that sense. Yeah, he takes his own views seriously, although also at the same time with flippancy, which would, in a paradoxical way, kind of be taking his ideas seriously. So um, that's Hume, and thank you uh, for having this discussion with me today. Thank you guys for listening, and maybe in the future we'll be able to touch on some of uh, Hume's moral ideas, or we might just skip straight into Kant uh, if we do continue having these. So thanks again, everybody. Take care.